Hello, this is The Briefing. I'm Victoria Fritz. Our top story today. After the tanker attacks in the Gulf, the US releases video which it claims shows Iran removing an unexploded mine. After a controversial and difficult two years in the White House, the press secretary, Sarah Sanders, confirms she is quitting at the end of the month. And ready for action, a nationwide women's strike takes place in Switzerland today. Oh, Canada. Toronto's Raptors claim the country's first ever NBA championship title. A very warm welcome to the programme, briefing you on all you need to know in global news, business and sport. And you can be part of the conversation as well today. Drivers who switch their commute from car to public transport should be paid $500 a year as a bonus from a proposed workplace parking levy in Scotland. This is according to one transport expert. We want to know, what would it take to get you out of your car? Get in touch. Just use this hashtag here, it's BBC The Briefing. Now, Iran says it categorically rejects U.S. claims that it is behind attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Amman. The U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, said that they had made their assessment based on intelligence about the type of weapons used. Now, the British Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, described the event as deeply worrying. Here is the very latest from our news reporter, Gareth Barlow. Crew members from the targeted tankers appearing on Iranian state TV. Incredible, many things that... One after another, they tell the camera they have hosted us really well. Everyone has taken care of us. A narrative Iran will be keen to promote as it denies any involvement in the attacks. A narrative strongly opposed by the United States, which has released footage it claims shows Iran's military removing a mine from the side of one of the tankers. The United States assesses that Iran is responsible for these attacks. No proxy group in the area has the resources or skill to act with this level of sophistication. Iran, however, has the weapons, the expertise and the requisite intelligence information to pull this off. As both sides promote their version of events, Iranian state TV broadcast these images, reportedly showing a rescue boat tackling a fire on the Norwegian tanker. Wrapped in flames, one of the two vessels hit by blasts on Thursday morning, as tensions between Washington and Tehran continue to rise, following the collapse of the Iranian nuclear deal. There isn't absolute evidence at this point, but we can assume the most likely suspect, which is probably hardline elements inside Iran or those operating outside that want to make sure that there are not negotiations that are renewed between the United States and Iran. The Straits of Hormuz are critically important for the world's oil supply and also for both sides. As Iran uses the power of its press and possible political factions, America is flexing the power of its planes. Both countries say they don't want war, but both do want the upper hand. Gareth Barlow, BBC News. Well, crude prices have continued to rise after spiking as much as 4.5% on Thursday. Now, 40% of all seaborne oil shipments go through the Strait of Ormuz. So the prospect of disruption has sent shockwaves through the market that's been in the doldrums in the recent months. Well, let's bring in Nina Trentman from the Wall Street Journal. I know you've been following this story. Uh, the oil price has been bouncing around as a result of this story, struggling a little bit for direction um, in early trade. Uh, today but longer term it's quite difficult to know what the impact of this kind of behavior is going to be well I guess it all depends on whether there's going to be some sort of admission from Iran whether they were involved in the attacks or not as, as Mr Pompeo has claimed yesterday well, I mean they've categorically denied that that's the case yes but well based on the evidence it seems that um, 
they are the only ones in the region that are capable and also in a position to actually do that at the moment. Um, I guess that will quite that would impact how the debate is going forward. Um, we've seen insurance rates for, for freight in the region going up yesterday and we've also seen, as you said, the oil price react. Um, this is, of course, a very crucial point um, in the world for oil transports um, across the world. And Iran has in the past said that it would disturb traffic through the Strait of Hormuz um, amid U.S. sanctions and amid the fact that it's in a recession at the moment. So I guess it's very, well, it's difficult to tell at this point in time who's responsible for what. But I guess if this continues, and it has, we have seen recent attacks before in, in May, um, that will, of course, drive up tensions in the region um, where we have a lot of um, shifting powers at the moment. Now, the U.S. and Iran both say that they do ha not want any kind of war. But these images, these images that have gone round the world of these tankers on fire and crews having to be rescued and talk of missiles and mines, I mean, that's going to put a lot of upset and, and concern around the stability of the entire region, surely. Well, yes, and the U.S. Um, has said that it's currently investigating whether it should offer protection to, to ships that are um, traveling in the region. Um, I guess war is a very big word here, um, and it remains to be seen whether there's going to be some sort of military pre-conflict stage. Um, I guess, of course, the Trump administration is quite aware of how difficult it is to manage the region. And um, it remains to be seen whether, like, at some point there's going to be negotiations between the Iranian government and the Trump administration following the pullout of the U.S. Um, out of the um, nuclear deal that was struck in 2015. So it's a very delicate balancing act, I think, at this point in time. It certainly is. Um, Nina, do stay with us because we're going to run through some of the papers a little bit later on because it is all over the international press today. Thanks very much. Now, let's keep you up to date uh, with this story. Loads more on the website on this. There's a feature on the history of the tensions between the US and Iran. Uh, that's all on bbc.com forward slash news. You can also download uh, the BBC News app as well. Well, President Trump's press secretary, Sarah Sanders, is set to leave the White House. Announcing her departure, the president said she was a warrior and a special woman. For the past two years, Ms. Sanders has had a combative relationship with uh, the press, who've accused her of lying repeatedly. Our North America correspondent, Chris Buckler, reports. For much of this presidency, Sarah Sanders has been the face of the White House and often the person left to defend the words of America's outspoken commander-in-chief. Yeah, we've been through a lot together, and she's tough, but she's good. As the press secretary for a president who dismissed most of the media as fake news, or something worse, her job was rarely easy. The president of the United States should not refer to us as the enemy of the people. Particularly in the often hostile White House briefing room. Um, I've addressed this question. I've addressed my personal feelings. I'm here to speak on behalf of the president. He's made his comments clear. But the special counsel, Robert Mueller, revealed in his report into allegations of electoral interference and obstruction of justice that Sarah Sanders admitted to lying from the podium when she claimed that FBI agents had contacted her to support President Trump's firing of the agency's then director, James Comey. The rank and file of the FBI had lost confidence in their director. Over time, there were fewer and fewer press briefings. The last one was more than three months ago. But Sarah Sanders has remained a close advisor to the president, putting her firmly in the fire of his critics. And I'm never really sure what to call Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Perhaps most notoriously, she was mercilessly attacked by the comedian Michelle Wolf at the White House Correspondents Dinner. Tom, but for white women who disappoint other white women. From a very political family, she always attempted to show the sometimes savage criticism didn't get to her. However, at times, she couldn't help but show emotion, most notably when talking about a mass shooting in Las Vegas that left dozens dead. The memory of those who displayed the ultimate expression of love in the midst of an unimaginable act of hate will never fade. In a tweet announcing her departure, President Trump said he hoped she would follow her father, Mike Huckabee, in running to become the governor of her home state of Arkansas. But for the moment, she has another priority. I have three amazing kids, and uh, I'm going to spend a little more time with them. And in the, 
In the meantime, I'm going to continue to uh, be one of the most uh, outspoken and loyal supporters of the president and his agenda. And I know he's going to have Hello. If Sarah Sanders has learned anything from being this president's spokesperson, it's that he likes to speak for himself. Chris Buckler, BBC News, Washington. Great person. Well, the World Health Organization will hold an emergency meeting later on on Friday to decide whether the spread of Ebola into Uganda from the eastern Congo amounts to an international emergency. A boy and his grandmother died after crossing the border and another family member with the disease has now been sent back. The outbreak in eastern Congo is the second worst in history and has killed more than a thousand people. But health officials say there's been no person-to-person -person spread in Uganda. While the disease has crossed the border, uh, there has been no documented local transmission. The exposure of these individuals occurred in, in, in Congo. However, it is a significant event. So this isn't, uh, this isn't a straightforward deliberation by, by any means uh, uh, for, for the committee. Let's brief you on some of the other stories making the news today. And the man accused of carrying out the terror attacks in Christchurch in New Zealand has pleaded not guilty to all 92 charges against him. Brenton Harrison Tarrant appeared by video link at the High Court. He's denied 51 charges of murder, 40 charges of attempted murder and one charge of terrorism. The Ukrainian cap uh, captain of a cruise ship that collided with a tourist boat on the River Danube, killing 28 people, has been released from police custody. He paid $50,000 in bail and promised to remain in Hungary until investigations are complete. Sudan's ruling military council has admitted for the first time that it ordered the security forces to break up a protest sit-in 10 days ago and said it regretted that mistakes were made. Dozens of people were shot dead. A spokesman said that the military was conducting its own investigation into the operation and some officers had already been arrested. He said that the regime will announce their findings on Saturday. And two years after the Grenfell Tower fire in London, three quarters of tall buildings with cladding are categorised still as unsafe. They haven't been told to get it removed or modified. The latest UK government figures suggest that work hasn't yet started on more than half, many of them privately owned. Events to remember the 72 people who died will take place later on Friday. A nationwide women's strike takes place in Switzerland on Friday with demonstrations across the country. Marches were held 28 years ago for pay equality, but campaigners say little has changed and discrimination in the workplace still exists. Imogen Fox reports from Bern. June 14, 1991. Half a million Swiss women took to the streets to protest against inequality. They had no right to maternity leave and not a single woman in the Swiss government. Dore Heim was there. 1991 was a real big bang. I think it was like a wake-up call for our politics. And since then, we have achieved a lot. We have more women being politicians. We have more laws for women, for example, paid maternity leave. So that day, almost 30 years ago, did achieve some things. But for a century, Swiss women have complained that equality is moving at a snail's pace. They didn't even get the vote until 1971. Today, combining work and family remains a huge challenge. Swiss women earn an average 20% less than men. For pensions, the gap is 37%. That's why women not even born in the last strike are preparing for another one and hoping for change. There are so many things I wish could be achieved after this strike. Um, one is like equal pay for equal work, less discrimination at the workplace and also in everyday life just because of your gender. Hundreds of thousands of women are expected out on the streets for the strike and Swiss employers are taking a relaxed attitude. No one's expected to be penalised for leaving work. The question really is, what will change in the long term, especially around that pay gap? Imogen Folks, BBC News, Bern. 
Stay with us here on BBC News. Still to come, we'll have more. The latest from Canada, of course, where Toronto's Raptors have claimed the country's first ever NBA championship title. You're watching The Briefing, our headlines today. Iran denies it, uh, but the US says, and the UK say it's true. They are blaming Tehran for the two attacks on oil tankers. After a controversial and difficult two years, one of Donald Trump's closest allies, Sarah Sanders, confirms she is quitting the White House in a few weeks' time. Let's bring you some breaking news because uh, I've got good news for you. If you are a Toronto Raptors fan, you have just won the NBA championship, the league title for the very first time in history. Now, the Canadian team have beaten the defending championships, the Golden State Warriors, in game five of the best of seven series in Toronto. The Warriors had been looking to claim their third consecutive title, their fourth in the past five seasons. It is the first time in history the Canadian team has won this league title it's the first basketball championship for the city and the country the Raptors are the only NBA team in Canada well I've got a fan with me Dr Aleem Ladder who's a Raptors fan he's in Toronto for us um Dr Aleem how does it feel it feels amazing it's been 25 years uh, I've been a Raptors fan since the very first season and uh, it just feels so incredible. I don't know if you can hear behind me, the fans are, are celebrating the streets, there's cars hooting, um, and it's, it's such an amazing feeling right now for the whole city and for the whole country. The, I mean, the whole city has really got behind this team. I mean, your official mascot is Drake, <laughs> the music artist. I mean, there's huge support for the Raptors. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not just the city. It's, there's, 50, there, there's an area just about 200 metres away from me right now called Jurassic Park. There were about 30,000 fans um, who were watching the game on multiple screens. And this was one of 59 Jurassic Parks throughout the whole country, um, from coast to coast, from Halifax to Victoria. The entire country was behind this team. And Drake was definitely there, too, uh, in Toronto today, uh, making the crowd laugh and, and celebrating with us all together as well. So what does it mean to Canada, this victory? Well, um, you know, basketball was invented by a Canadian, uh, Dr. James Naismith. And, uh, you know, um, this, this, this uh, sport has just really grown in, in the last few years in, in Canada. Um, people from, from all parts of the country uh, playing basketball in high school, playing basketball in college. Um, the country has started producing some of the top NBA players um, in the last few years. And it's just, it, this sport means so much to our country. It's always known for hockey, but now basketball is, is definitely going to be one of the greatest sports in this country for sure. Yeah, lots of people are talking about it as the sport of the future for Canada. I mean, why do you think it really resonates? What, what is it that Canadians love so much about this game? It's just so much fun to play. Um, you know, it's, it, you know it's, it's, it's a gripping game. I mean, I was, I was talking to your producer earlier, uh, just before the Raptors won. There was one second left, and we, I still couldn't tell her for sure whether or not we were going to win. The, the game is just so much fun, and it, and it resonates across... Um, cultural boundaries, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and throughout all, all uh, walks of society, everyone just loves this game. It has such a huge, <laughs> such a huge uh, presence throughout all walks of society here in Canada. OK, well, you're doing a great job talking to us, but how are you going to go and celebrate when you're off camera? Oh, I'm going to celebrate. Well, my wife's British. Uh, I've taught her all about the game. Um, so my wife, Salim, and I are going are gonna to go celebrate. Um, it's a little bit late for us, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're going to definitely uh, live up uh, what's going on outside for sure. Yeah, you should go join the party. Dr. Aleem Ladder, thank you very much for your time. Congratulations. <laughs> you. Let's move on and talk about some of the other sports, shall we? We'll get it all from the BBC Sports Centre. Hello there, I'm Tolson Tollett, and this is your Friday spot for me, Tolson Tollett, and the rest of the team. That is your Friday sport briefing. Now here's our briefing of some of the key events happening a little bit later on today. A Caravaggio painting found in an attic in southwest France back in 2014 goes on display in Paris ahead of its auction later on. Uh, this is next week, I think the auction is happening. This painting has a guide price, if you're interested, of uh, between 100 and 150 million euros. 
an extradition hearing for Julian Assange is taking place in London. The WikiLeaks founder is facing extradition to the United States. He is, of course, accused of conspiring to break into a classified Pentagon computer. That's 9 o'clock GMT. Uh, three hours later, in Washington, President Trump will be celebrating his 73rd birthday. Happy birthday, Mr. Trump. Mr. President, uh, I won't sing, I promise. Um, shall we move on and talk about orangutans? Because France's most famous one, uh, not Donald Trump, of course, has been delighting zoo visitors just ahead of her 50th birthday. Nanette is no ordinary orangutan. She is the resident artist of the zoo at the Jardin des Plantes in Paris, where the Borneo born ape arrived as a three year old back in 1972. A party is planned at the zoo on Sunday, where she'll be treated to a birthday cake and she will share her talents in an art workshop. Whatever next. Uh, let's talk about our talking point today. Uh, it's a story that's in the Times newspaper in the UK. This idea that drivers who switch their commute from car to public transport should be paid a bonus, a $500 bonus, £400, British pounds, according to a leading transport expert. This comes after a new workplace parking levy is being proposed in Scotland. We've been asking you what it would take for you to give up your car. Lots of people are quite cynical about this, saying that actually it won't happen and people are so lazy these days they're even having their breakfast delivered someone called disco is saying thinking of going back to their car as the railway service is so incredibly bad do keep your thoughts coming in use the hashtag bbc the briefing i'll see you soon Hello. As the flooding and disruption continues, particularly across parts of England, some spots have now amassed three months' worth of June rainfall in a week, over 150 millimetres in the wettest spots. Still rain in the forecast as low pressure moves towards the northwest of the UK. It's just not as wet as it's been. Still plenty of showers around, mind you. And another area of rainfall affecting parts of England and Wales as Friday begins, also raining in northwest Scotland. But as we go on through the day, if you're starting the day with rain, things will slow slowly improve as the rain clears. It brightens up to an afternoon of sunny spells, perhaps a shower. Here's a closer look at things at 8 in the morning. See where the rain is into the West Niles, the odd shower elsewhere in Scotland. Fairly chilly, though, where you've got the clearer skies here and into Northern Ireland as the day begins. Further outbreaks of rain, though, affecting parts of Northern England, the Midlands into Wales, maybe for some in southwest England. East of that, though, well, the further east you are across East Anglia and the far southeast, where well, you may just start the day with some sunshine. It is a sign of things to come because the two areas of rain we can see here are going to be easing. And if you're within that first thing, it gradually brightens up to an afternoon of sunny spells. The chance of a shower could be heavy, possibly thundery. Very few, though, into East Anglia and southeast England, perhaps as high as 20 Celsius. And for many of us, it will feel a bit warmer compared with recent days, especially where you've been stuck in the rain. It will turn wetter again, though, on Friday evening in Northern Ireland as another system moves in here towards southwest Scotland, Wales and western England as Saturday begins. Some clear spells, perhaps the odd shower to the east of that. Just refresh our minds about the big picture at the start of the weekend. Low pressure to the northwest feeding in showers or bands of showers in from the west. So this is the first one we're contending with on Saturday morning. We'll be slowly pushing further east as the day goes on. Ahead of it, some sunshine, perhaps a shower. Behind it, some some sunshine and a few showers breaking out, especially into Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. Again, some of these could be heavy, possibly thundery, and temperatures in the mid to high teens on a breezy day. Part two of the weekend on Sunday looks even breezier. And again, it's sunshine and showers initially towards the north and west, some pushing a little further east as we go through the day. But it is showers and not the hours and hours of rain that some of us have had over the past week. Hello, this is the Business Briefing. I'm Victoria Fritz. Crude prices continue to rise on fears of global oil supplies as tensions escalate in the Strait of Ormuz. Plus, virtual reality check. Sales of the headsets decline. Are they still the future or leading us down a little bit of a blind alley? Also on the markets, oil prices continuing their rise. Asian stocks a little bit subdued, though, ahead of some pretty key Chinese economic data coming out in a couple of hours' time.
Hello there, we're going to start with the price of oil. Sorry, I'm choking at the beginning of our programme. Uh, let's talk oil, shall we? Because it has continued to rise after spiking by more than 4% on Thursday after explosions damaged two tankers off the coast of Iran as they left the Strait of Ormuz. Well, the Secretary of State for America, Mike Pompeo, has called them the latest in a series of attacks by Iran, which has denied, of course, all involvement. Washington has also blamed Tehran for attacks on four tankers last month. You might remember that. Pretty much in the same area, all of which the country denies. Now, this area links the Middle Eastern oil producers to markets in Europe. You can see it here. At its narrowest point, this gap here, separating Iran from Oman, is just 21 miles. There are only two shipping lanes, each just two miles wide. More than 17 million barrels per day pass through the strait. This is according to the very latest figures. That's almost 40% of all global oil shipments by tanker and nearly a fifth of the, oils, uh, of the world's oil supply. It also, it's of course the main export route for Iranian oil, worth about $66 billion back in 2017. That was until President Trump tightened sanctions on the country and cracked down on countries buying Iran's oil. Well, the president of Iran, uh, Rouhani, has hinted that oil shipments through the Strait of Ormuz could be disrupted if the United States tries to strangle Iran's economy. Michelle Fleury in New York has more. It was inevitable that oil prices reacted the way they did. Any disruption to the flow of oil is going to raise concerns about supply and, in turn, have a knock-on effect on the price of oil, pushing it higher, as we saw. Now, when you consider that a quarter of the world's oil is shipped through the Strait of Hormuz, any threats to tankers in that area is going to alarm traders. But I think it's worth pointing out that as big as the spike in the price of oil was, if you look, for example, at West Texas Intermediate, which is the U.S. sweet crude, the price is still substantially below its high from earlier this year. It's still trading below $60 a barrel. Now, there is a degree of waiting to find out more definitively who may have been behind these attacks. Mike Pompeo, the U.S. Secretary of State, blamed Iran for the attacks on a Japanese and Norwegian tanker, even as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe visited Tehran. What's clear is that the standoff between the U.S. and Iran has been simmering for a while now and that this attack is the most recent in a pattern of disruption. Earlier this month, there was an attack on several tankers and there was also a drone attack on a Saudi pipeline. Now, given how easy it is to interrupt the flow of oil, some analysts are predicting an increase in the price of oil of as much as $7. But motorists at the pump may not notice a difference. If you run an oil tanker company, though, well, that's a different story. You may see your insurance rates go up, for example, and in turn, you may then charge your customers more who may choose to pass that cost on. The knock-on effect is hard to quantify, but you can see how an increase in the price of oil could trickle down to the rest of the economy. Well, Nitesh Shah is the Director of Research at the investment management company Wisdom Tree and joins me now. Uh, Nitesh, how worried are the, are the investors that you're dealing with when it comes to what appears to be a rising level of conflict and, um, and a sort of aggravation in the region? Yeah. Well, over the past month, I think investors have been ignoring the risks. Uh, oil prices have been falling. Uh, they had reached uh, $75 a barrel just a month and a half ago, and they're falling close to $60 a barrel in terms of Brent. They've been ignoring these risks, but they were reminded of these risks just yesterday when these uh, uh, tankers in the, uh, in, in the region were attacked. None of them were oil tankers. Uh, they were carrying other products, but it's just a reminder that that region is very important place for oil to exit from the uh, Arabian Peninsula and, and into the world markets. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it's sort of almost sentiment marking, isn't it? What's going on with price at the moment with the oil price? Because actually, in terms of disruption of the oil market, this hasn't made any difference, has it, yet? Not yet, but it's, it's just, uh, once again, another reminder that it could happen. Uh, last month, there were attacks on uh, <coughs> four vessels, which... Um, uh, basically caused some disruption that subsided, but this is a new, new reminder. Um, what we may find is in the in the future is that uh, 
the demand for oil, which is put under question by, by investors, may not really fall apart because uh, towards the end of this month, uh, the US and China are uh, hopefully meeting up in, in Osaka in Japan, and they may come towards some sort of a trade deal. If demand doesn't falter, but there is uh, question marks into how uh, easily supply will reach the markets, oil prices could go substantially higher. It, it's interesting because, I mean, it's, it's very easy to believe, isn't it, um, that the world's oil is all going around on tankers and it, you know, it's all sort of liquid oil. But actually, I mean, that's kind of discounting the huge boom in shale, yeah. in the production of oil and gas that's, that's coming from the US and from Canada. So I'm wondering how that plays into all of that. Yeah, so the, the oil supply from the US is growing. The US is already the world's largest crude supplier. Um, and as a result of countries like OP, uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia who are cooperating with OPEC, having cut down supply, um, US is gaining a lot more market share. Uh, unfortunately for right now, for US, it's probably hit its capacity in terms of how much it can export. It needs to build out a lot more infrastructure to be able to export at higher volumes. But at this point in time, it is investing in that infrastructure. So within a year's time or so, it can even increase its exports more than that 3 million barrels per day that it's exporting today. It's going to be fascinating to watch. Uh, Nitesh Shah, thanks very much for coming on You're and uh, explaining the oil market for us. Thank you. You're most welcome. Now let's talk tech now, shall we? Because for years, virtual reality headsets have been touted as the future of gaming, education and even communication. But sales of the hardware have fallen sharply this year. So can new games and devices reinvigorate this industry? Chris Fox reports from the E3 Gaming Show in LA. This is a crucial time for virtual reality. The next generation of hardware has just been released and will prove if the tech has sticking power or is just a novelty. This is the Oculus Quest, Facebook's latest attempt to make a VR headset that is better quality than using your phone, but more portable than being tethered to a computer. The new headset works anywhere with no equipment to set up, eliminating one of the main obstacles with high quality VR. But it's the games that will draw people in, and at E3, one of VR's biggest hits announced new content. Beat Saber lets players smash blocks in time to the music, and it's so easy to play, it's become a VR staple. We are actually getting people who are getting the headset only because of Beat Saber. They get the headset, they just buy it, and the first game they want to play and try is Beat Saber. Studios have also become better at tackling some of the early sticking points of VR. This is Phantom Covert Ops, which has a unique way of letting players move around without giving them motion sickness. Often in VR games you have to teleport your character to move around, or you have to push a stick to move them around, and that takes you out of the experience a little bit. The really unique and powerful thing about putting you in control of a kayak is that you're driving the motion with your arms, and that's exactly what the character in the game is doing as well. So, what is the future for virtual reality? There was a tendency to try and become a cross-media kind of entertainment proposition in terms of VR. So they had 360 video, but it doesn't really fulfill the promise of VR. So I think focusing on interactive content and games is the way to go. While players at E3 were happy to queue to try the latest games, there was little made of VR's educational or social applications. The view from E3 seems to be that VR has found its groove in gaming. Chris Fox, BBC News, Los Angeles. Let's uh, bring you up to date with what's going on with advertising here in the UK because a ban has come into force on adverts harming, uh, featuring... Let's have a look at some of the news that's trending today in the business news. And the Wall Street Journal is looking at this story here. Trump says it could retaliate if Xi, President Xi, bulks at the trade meeting. This is according to a top White House economic advisor. Some of the warnings there saying that there could be more tariffs if China's leader doesn't agree to a face-to-face -face meeting at the upcoming G20 summit. Elsewhere, talking about courts, and they're talking about why the Hong Kong protesters were afraid to use their metro cards. It reports that people queuing to buy subway tickets, they were doing so with cash so that they couldn't be traced. 
with their smart cards and the data then used to prove that they were actually there at those protests. One of the dangers of the growing cashless society, says Quartz. Over on Business Insider, they're saying that spending on pets has increased by over $22 billion in the past 10 years alone. That's an increase of more than 50%. The reason could be millennials leaving, uh, having children later and having pets instead. Who knows? Let us know what you think about that story and all the others as well. It's hashtag BBC The Briefing, all one word. Let's have a look at some of the markets, see what's going on. Uh, before we go, a bit of a strange session going on in Asia, struggling for a little bit of direction, but the oil price, it continues to rise on those fears about global supply and what looks to be escalating conflict and uh, aggravation in the region when it comes to Iran and the US. Plenty more coming up a little bit later on. I'll see you soon. Legislation around the growing number of tattoo shops needs to be tightened to avoid risk of infection. So says the Royal Society for Public Health. They say that one in five people who have a tattoo or a piercing end up reporting negative side effects. Currently, there is no standard legal requirement that shops have to have to uh, meet on infection control. Uh, Dominic Hughes reports. For most people, getting a tattoo or a piercing is a straightforward procedure. But there are health risks whenever the barrier that is formed by our skin is broken. And health experts say not enough is being done to prevent infection. The whole desire for body modification is something that's uh, grown in the last uh, couple of decades as people become you know, more interested in, in their body image. Um, and that's great, but um, the legislation just hasn't caught up. And we'd like to see a level playing field, basically. I think, I think it would be useful for anyone in the UK to, to know that wherever they're going, um, they, they can be assured that the person who's giving them a special procedure, such as a tattoo, is suitably qualified in infection control. Um, and so that it really does minimise the risk of side effects. The number of shops offering tattoos and piercings has rocketed in recent years, up by more than 170% in just a decade. One in five of us now has a tattoo. But in a survey of more than 800 people who were tattooed, pierced or underwent acupuncture or electrolysis in the last five years, 18% reported negative side effects. Wales is the only part of the UK where a compulsory licensing scheme for tattoo parlours and others offering similar services is being introduced. Today's report says that not enough is being done in the rest of the country to protect the public from potentially serious infection. Dominic Hughes, BBC News. For that story and more, breakfast is coming up at six o'clock with Charlie and Nagger. This is the briefing from BBC News, the latest headlines for you. The US military has released a video it says shows Iranian forces removing an unexploded mine from one of the ships attacked in the Gulf of Amman on Thursday. And the White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders is to leave her post at the end of this month. Women in Switzerland are going on strike to protest at what they say is continued sexual discrimination in the country. Now it's time to take a look at some of the stories that are making the headlines in the media across the world today. And we begin with the Arab news and uh, the image of the oil tanker Front Altair on fire. I mean, you can see it there in the Gulf of Amman. That's dominating the front page of the Arab news, but also, to be perfectly honest, across lots of the international press today. The paper is reporting on comments made by the US Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, blaming Iran for the suspected assaults on two oil tankers tankers. The FT also talking about this story, uh, focusing on the impact of the attack on the financial markets. They're illustrating the point with a graph you can see there uh, showing how the incident has pushed up the price of Brent crude oil by as much as 4.5 percent, although it did come down a little bit after that. The Daily Telegraph, along with many of the UK papers, is leading on the same story, Boris Johnson and his bid to be the next British Prime Minister. The paper reports on comments from Mr Johnson's supporters who have called on 
what they describe as vanity candidates to drop out of the race to speed up the selection process. The Japan Times is leading with an interview, an exclusive actually, with the US ambassador to Japan, who told the paper that President Trump is frustrated by the lack of a trade deal so far and wants one in place by August. And finally, on the front page of the Times, Scotland, this report by a leading transport expert, we're talking about it today, it's our big talking point, who says that drivers who switch their commute from car to public transport should be paid a £400 a year bonus, that's about $500 US dollars, as a way of combating Scotland's climate and obesity crises. Well, with me now is Nina Trentman from the Wall Street Journal. Um, Nina, let's start with the Arab news here and sort of this, this picture that's been on all of the papers today. They say that Tehran, uh, well, the US uh, security uh, consultant telling Arab news that Tehran had the motive, the means and the opportunity to uh, do this crime. And the Iranians always have an act for reason. I mean, what... What is it that they're referring to here, in a nutshell? And what does that mean for the political system in Iran? Well, it refers, of course, to the fact that Iran is a regional power that has military equipment and that has in the past um, been, been able to showcase that. Um, I think what's imp interesting in this article is that um, it points to the fact that within Iran there is, of course, not just one solid bloc that is now driving this this forward, but that there is disagreement between um, various fractions and factions and parties. Um, so we have um, the president Rouhani, which was re-elected in 2017, who is somewhat centrist. We have um, the supreme leader um, Ayatollah Khamenei, who has um, been trying to keep control, as the paper says, of the um, Islamic Revolutionary Guard cause that the U.S. actually sanctioned in 2018. And the concern is that the current situation and the recession in Iran and also the well, tight U.S. sanctions on Iran are leading to that sort of like more radical faction within the Iranian um, system to gain power. So I guess it remains very much to be seen what Mr. Rouhani, what Mr. Um, Khamenei are saying in the coming days to see where this is going and whether this is sort of like marking a step change as to how the Iranian leadership is, is dealing with this current issue where we're seeing um, economic pressures um, building up. Mm. Uh, the Financial Times very much looking at the cost of this conflict and what this is meaning for global markets and in particular the oil market talking about this four and a half um, percent spike in oil prices we saw yesterday. They also focus in on the timing of these attacks yesterday just as Iran's supreme leader and I guess ultimate decision maker at the moment was meeting Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and Shinzo Abe is one of the leaders who is trying to forge some sort of peace between the US and Iran. That doesn't look like that's happening anytime soon. Well, yeah, the timing is actually really interesting. And of course, it's not a co I would assume it's not a coincidence. Um, interestingly enough, both Mr. Um, Trump as well as the Iranian government have said that this is at the moment not the time for negotiations. So it seems that Mr. Abe was um, on a mission there, but it seems that it's sort of like maybe the wrong time. Um, I think it's of course also interesting to see how this um, fits into the current situation of global markets where we've seen a lot of volatility and fluctuation because of tensions between the US and China and other trade partners and so it seems that this is just opening another front of volatility and of, of nervousness um, in the market. Um, this will of course also have implications for companies operating in the region. Um, we yesterday had a story for example about um, freight companies and, and companies that are transporting oil through the Strait of Hormuz and other places in the Persian Gulf um, saying that insurance fees have gone up and will continue going up and that certain um, vessels are being held at where they are even mm. though they're set to go um, because of um, lack of clarity about where this is going and whether there's an ongoing threat. So I guess there will be, an, of course, an economic cost um, caused by this. And also, of course, an economic benefit if you happen to be a producer of oil which the United States is. Yes, that's true. Um, but I guess, of course, you always have to, to counterbalance that with any 
costs that are um, being caused if there was some sort of increased escalation of the situation. Um, I think it also remains to be seen how far the oil price is going up because mm. it's still lower than what we've seen um, recently. Um, so it seems as if that's still up to be seen, I guess. Yes. Uh, let's move on, shall we, and talk about uh, the Daily Telegraph. And of course, they are, well, they do have a picture of the tanker as well. But below that, an article about the uh, Conservative leadership race there. And uh, they say that supporters of Boris Johnson are urging the others, referring to them as vanity candidates, to drop out. Um, and we are, for our sins, going to have a beauty parade <laughs> of uh, some of these candidates on television on Sunday evening in the UK. Um, will you be watching? Possibly. Um, I, I haven't decided yet. Um, I guess it's, of course, quite interesting that this is going on with, well, such an extended um, number of, of candidates, even though from the beginning when Theresa May was saying that she would step down as the head of the Conservative Party and also as Prime Minister, that people were already saying, oh, well, then that's now a time for, for Boris, to, Boris Johnson to, to take over. Um, yeah, I guess it's going to take some more days and possibly weeks and months until we have a new prime minister. And um, time is, of course, running out. Well, given... absolutely. I mean, there's only six weeks left until the parliamentary summer recess. And, you know, you can understand the perhaps impatience of some MPs that they have some form of leadership in place because there is that October 31st deadline, the, the latest of the Brexit deadline, shall we say. Yeah. And... At the moment, there's no clarity of the terms of the UK's exit at all. So, yeah. But I guess, of course, there's also party protocol, how you select a leader. And I guess there's also people in the party that would say, well, no, we have to stick to this. So unless more of these candidates now drop off and drop out, there's going to be mm. more voting um, until there's only two candidates left. It'll be interesting to see whether Boris Johnson, uh, who has not confirmed whether or not he will be part of those televised yes, debates care, yeah. on Sunday, will actually do so, because he seems to be doing very well by yeah. saying very little at the yes, moment. Yes. Um, Japan Times, and this exclusive interview with the US top envoy to Japan, in which he's saying that the president is frustrated, he feels that the country is way behind behind schedule and agreeing any kind of trade deal. But he's looking for a lot, isn't he, from Japan. He wants them to open up their auto and their agricultural sectors. And it appears that the more time that goes on, the greater the gap seems to be growing between these two countries. Even though, of course, they historically have been very aligned. Um, it's also interesting that it isn't actually that long that they've been discussing a trade deal. Um, they started talking about it when the U.S. pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, of which Japan is a part. And I guess from a Japanese, Japanese point of view, it would have been very good if the, if the U.S. had stayed in that. And since then, it's been two and a half years that they've been negotiating. And as a European Union citizen, I'm quite aware of like how long the EU and Japan, for example, negotiated their trade deal, which took effect um, earlier this year. So. Yeah, I think, of course, the U.S. is a very is currently in a very um, ambitious mood when it comes to striking trade deals. Um, but, yeah, it remains to be seen whether Japan is suffering the same fate of China um, if it doesn't make many progress, um, much progress. Yes. OK, uh, Nina, thanks very much. We do not have time to get to The Times, ironically, uh, but do let me know what you think of that story. Would a financial incentive get you out of your car and onto public transport? Let me know. Stay with us here on BBC News.